face here. Maybe not one y'all are excited to see, but oh well. Just like Nomi, I'm supposed to have no chance of winning this thing. So let's see if I can buck that trend for a second week in a row. Well, grace you all with my presence once again. Well, I promise this week my story will be the long one. <laughs> you see, with me, there are no happy mediums. One week I write a nine-page story about nothing, and another I write one that I will not even have half a page on. Still about nothing. That's right, kids, it's time for Sports Block. In a moment of true horror, the peace that has stood for years was broken. I'm not talking about the tensions between North Korea and the United States. No, this is far more serious. I'm referring, of course, to Metaworld World Peace's injury. A torn meniscus in the left knee was the diagnosis, and surgery was the solution. World Peace went under the knife and was expected to miss a minimum of six weeks. And yet, 12 days later, World Peace returned. He played an astounding 15 minutes and scored four points on one, and with one assist on one for three shooting. How is this possible? How can someone return from serious surgery so quickly? The man now dubbed Wolverine by Kobe Bryant for his miraculous hearing, healing factor has the answer. An answer so simple, that so elegant, an answer so profound that it may very well change the landscape of sports medicine. In the words of Meta himself, well, uh, you know, I'm just too sexy for my cat. Let the implications of that statement sink in for a moment. World Peace went on to elaborate saying, I'm just too sexy for my cat, and if I wasn't as sexy for my cat, I probably wouldn't have came back. Because I'm sexy, I came back. He was even too sexy to wear a sleeve or a bracelet. This translated into a feeling of sexiness on the court as well. This begs the question, if sexiness worked for Meta, can it work for other athletes as well? Fortunately, it seems so. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines sexy as sexually suggestive or stimulating. Many athletes, especially male athletes, are admired for their robust body and thickly toned muscle. Can we get a, uh, a napkin here for Kenny? He's drooling everywhere at the mention of men. Um, Anyways, if athletes can channel their sexiness like Meta, injuries will heal in days instead of weeks. There's another factor involved, however. Athletes will need to acquire a cat for sexual comparison. This is the basis of World Peace's miraculous return to health. I see nothing but good from this trend. Athletes will likely select ugly and unappealing cats, cats that are rarely adopted so as to ensure that their sexiness is greater than that of their cats. This phenomenon can be solved using advanced mathematics. If S of A, which is the sexiness of the, the athlete, divided by S of C, the sexiness of cat, equals Y, where S is measured in sexons and Y is a unitless number. If Y is greater than 1, then we know the athlete is capable of self-induced erotic recovery. If Y is equal to or less than 1, then we know the athlete must abide by the same governing healing principles that apply to normal humans. This is truly a remarkable time to be a scientist. Meta World Peace's breakthrough is poised to revolutionize how we treat athletes and their patients. Soon, sexiness will mean quicker readiness. Well, good thing I brought a cat for this week's show, Doug. Um, he's under the table. With the addition of Kevin Cobb, the Bills, must, uh, the Bills' murky draft situation becomes even murkier. It was widely expected before Cobb's addition that the priority would be quarterback, with most experts predicting the Bills using their eighth pick on it. Now, we're not so sure. The Bills now have a quarterback who, while he has struggled to win games and then stay on the field, can start if necessary. I also personally believe Cobb is a lot better than people give him credit for, and with a good offensive line and running game, the things, things he did, uh, which are things he did not have in Arizona, he could be very successful. Doug Marone has publicly stated that the addition will not change the Bills' strategy, meaning they still intend to pick up a quarterback who will compete for the starting job. The question is, who will this quarterback be, and will they take him in the first or second round? There are a few ways the Bills could draft. With the first pick, I can see them going with a guard, a wide receiver, or a quarterback. Most likely that would mean Tavon or Austin or Cora Durrell Patterson, who is actually visiting uh, Buffalo right now, Chance Warmack, or Geno Smith. I personally am not sold on Geno Smith and would much rather the Bills take Austin or Warmack with that number eight pick. I'm also not sure Smith will be there with the Jaguars, Raiders, Browns, and Cardinals picking ahead of the Bills, all teams that could conceivably take a quarterback. Tavon Austin is small but electric, and Chance Warmack is one of the best guard prospects in years. The Bills could also be high on Ryan Nassib. I think he has a lot of upside, and having him progress with the same coaches would be really good for his development. But the Bills have to realize he will not make it to their second round pick. If they want him, they either have to take him at eight, or trade down and take him in the middle or late first round, something Buddy Nix has been very unwilling to do in the past. I have a feeling they may take him at eight. 
Crazy as that may seem to some people, remember how crazy the Dolphins' Tannehill pick seemed, and now he's one of the most promising youngsters in the NFL. If the Bills do take Austin or Warmack in the first, be looking for them to take a QB with that second pick. It just would have to be Emmanuel or Barkley instead of Smith or Nassib. It will be interesting to see how it all plays out, that's for sure. Ready. Well, welcome back, everyone. It's time for the cookie jar! That was real lively. <laughs> Here we go. Let's draw one of these babies out. Oh, all right. All right, let's see what we got. Well, Sam doesn't want to start with it. Who, who is the biggest winner at the NHL's trade deadline? I'm going to go with the Buffalo Sabres, believe it or not. And the reason I say this is they got rid of Pominville, who is a solid player, but he's costing them a ton of money. And you look at who they ended up with. You got no idea. I'm sorry, this guy's real distracting over here. They got and it's four pounds. They got a sixth round pick, two excellent prospects, including a goalie prospect in Hackett, as well as some other guy. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting distracted here by by the hand <laughs> signals that are going on. Kenny's easily distracted. Well, that's okay, Kenny. Um, I'm going to take a different team here. I'm going to take the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think they added a lot of big name scores. Uh, recently, they've added Jesse Jokinen. You've got the scorers, Brendan Mor Morrow and at? Jerome Iglina. My notes, Kenny. I come prepared. All right? Where are your notes? Huh? You stole those from Doug. These are not. Doug has much more <laughs> messy handwriting than this, Kenny. You know that. <laughs> um, so uh, they added a lot of scoring power, which is something Pittsburgh had been lacking, something that I think that could really put them over the hump this coming year. Um, Brendan Morrow, Jerome Iglina. Ig 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 um, <laughs> it's okay. It's hard both, to pronounce these, these It's names. very difficult to pronounce them. Um, are both high-level scores. They got a lot of upside to them, and I think they'll really help the Penguins out in years to come. They're long-term solutions for a lot of their problems. All right, let's see what we got going on. What do we here. got here? Okay, that was a disaster. It truly was. How surprising is the Yankees' ability to score 11 runs the past two games with so many superstars sidelined? It's just like football. Any given Sunday, or in this case, any given Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. The Yankees have a very deep lineup that people don't give them credit for a lot of the time. And the big thing is they still had Cano on the field. Robinson Cano has been torrid ever since the World Baseball Classic and is a truly bright and, yeah, and bright young star for the Yankees. He is really going to anchor that lineup in the years to come with the transition that's happening, especially with Jeter starting to show his age and Teixeira also aging and also A-Rod you know, being A-Rod and not being able to produce anything. Cano is going to be the face of the Yankees in years to come. Okay. Well, I see that Cano definitely played a role in this. I think the real thing, the real reason that they scored 11 runs was the fact that they were playing um, the Indians. The Indians have absolutely atrocious pitchers. They ranked 28th in um, earned runs average, and they're 24th in uh, walks plus hits per... Uh, whip is wit, walks, yeah, whips, hits, and yeah, whip. pitch. That, that's what I was looking for. See, this is what I love about sports ball. We got some great camaraderie. We really like share. We share. I don't even know other. who this kid is, yeah. but I'm just gonna he say is. the so, fact that they're playing the Indians. 
The fact that they're playing yeah. the Indians has nothing to do with it. They it are a solid does. team. But no, no they are a solid team. Pitchers. Their pitchers are terrible. The Indians' pitchers aren't as bad as you're saying. No, they truly It's a new factors. season. It's early. There's the fact third, is the what, Yankees are a very teams, solid like team. There's like 30 teams in both leagues, and, these, and they're in 28th in uh, ERA and You're taking away credit from whip. the Yankees players. Gardner's still no, there. They have a very they solid lineup. They do have a solid line, but it dealt more with the fact that the Indians are just awful. I don't think the Indians are as bad as you're saying. Well, I guess we'll agree to disagree. I'm not going to agree to disagree, but well, we're going to disagree well, and slide this back over. Pass that then. over. Well, well we're going to move away from Skip and Stephen A. over there for some real sports talk. Sam, take it home. Were the charge in the Syracuse loss and the jump ball in the Wichita State the right calls? They were at very crucial points in their respective games. Did they have a major impact on who became champion? I'll start with this. Um, now, when we say the charge in the Syracuse game, there, there are actually two charges that we're talking about. Um, we're, the, the one that I think that, that uh, we're meant to discuss um, is uh, the one by Trish right at the end there with the two points. But I think that that charge, look, the one by Trish, that was a close call, could have been called either way. The feet went down pretty close to right when Trish started making contact, so it's, it really was a tough call, I think, and it could have gone either way. The one uh, that I'm mad about is the one earlier on on Michael Carter-Williams at about half court that turned, uh, turned the tide of the game. I think that is the one that really Syracuse should be angry about because it was not a charge. If anything, it was a block. The guy's feet were not set. Uh, he was moving around. That is the one when Syracuse was driving from down six, uh, when that charge was called, that turned the tide of the game and forced Trish to have to make that run into the, into the lane for that layup with two points. Had that, not, had that first charge not happened, we wouldn't have had that issue. The Wichita State jump ball called real early. I haven't seen a jump ball called that early in a long time. I don't know about that. I say you let, you give it a few more seconds, uh, you know, even one more second, and Wichita State would have had that ball. Instead, they call it way too early uh, and, you know, give the ball over to Louisville, and I think that was that was a mistake. It's hard to disagree with all the points you made. I mean, I think a lot of the time charges and, and blocks go either way. There are times where, obviously, they're very clear, as you were talking about. But in get, this more case, they this, were. get more into this, Kenny. I am getting more into this. I'm sorry that I'm not lively. I don't go into people's frames and yell at people's faces. I can't do that all the time. <laughs> but, but I agree. I think the jump ball definitely could have been, they could, definitely could have waited before they called it. I mean, normally. Yeah, they could have waited. Jump. Okay. A, ju <laughs> <laughs> a jump ball's normally called after a couple seconds instead of just two guys touching each other for about a second and then a whistle going off. So. Kenny's got one thing on his mind. Yeah. <laughs> obviously. Well, fast all I mean, Kenny knows a lot about touching guys, so we're just going to let him. Yeah. We're going to let him be the expert on that one. All right, last up. As of right now, who is the NBA's MVP? Doug? Okay. My thing with the MVP is when you break it down, it's the most valuable player. But I, I interpret that as most valuable to their team. LeBron James is truly incredible. However, you take him away from the Heat, they still make the playoffs. So I'm going to go with... Carmelo Anthony. I'm repping my boys in New York City, and here's here's the thing about Melo. When he doesn't play, the Knicks do awful. They're terrible, and right now they're on what? It's like a 13-game win streak. Yeah, they're just it's, it's on incredible. Fire right it's because Melo is being a beast. He's going for that scoring title. He's beating out Kevin Durant right now. He just dropped. Uh, uh, well, he had like several 40-plus point games, a 51-point game. Melo is the most valuable player to his team. On that line, you know, I'm also going to go away from LeBron. You know, no, not trying to disrespect him at all. He's an all-pro, definitely. He's a regular However, of this show, so uh -huh? you got to be careful not to disrespect him. He's a regular. I, that's fine. I, you know, LeBron, you know, I love you, man. But <laughs> i got to go with my boy James Harden out there. I fear the beard. I'll tell you right now, he has turned that Houston team around. Coupling James Harden and Jeremy Lin in that backcourt has really given them a spark, and they are an entertaining team to watch now. James Harden was stuck playing sixth man in Oklahoma City, and he was okay with that. Instead, he took a risk. He took a gamble. He jumped to Houston, and now he is a first-tier superstar. He has sparked that team. They're on a solid run, and they're going to be a force to be reckoned with in the playoffs and years to come, especially with some great big men coming up in free agency and in the draft. It's going to be a really great opportunity for Houston to become a more all-around team and shore up their inside presence. And it's, it's often easy to overlook that how much Harden's stats have jumped since last year. He's oh, easily ridiculous. most improved player of the year. Oh. I mean, he's playing phenomenal. 
Oh, I mean, you just, it's apples and oranges comparing. But, but it's still mellow, is the MVP. No, it's Harden. Yeah. No. It's Harden. Mm -mm. Anyway. Stop saying Harden. Kenny's getting excited. I know he is. But on that note, we're going to cut to commercial. Give Kenny some time to calm down. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Brittany Griner at Ford for the Dallas Mavericks. Crazy idea. I know what you're saying, and as I was, and as I was already told, you all talked about it last week. However, will Mark Cuban pull the trigger to bring her in? Maybe. Should he? No. Her game centers around her length advantage over her competition in college. In the NBA, she would lose that advantage. Out of the current crop of women players available, I'd tell every GM to draft Elena Deladon out of Delaware. In addition to being drop-dead gorgeous, Della Don has remarkable athleticism and a phenomenal outside shot. At 6'5", she would fit in perfectly at the two-guard. She has a length advantage over many shooting guards. Dwayne Wade and Monta Ellis are much shorter than it, and is the same height as Kobe and James Harden. Her game is a solid fit for an NBA team looking to spread the floor, such as Houston or Miami. Her shooting from long and mid-range, as well as her scorer's mentality, would complement any team, though. However, enough about my crush on Della Don and her mad skills. On to what sport we'll see a woman in soonest. To start, NASCAR, entertaining, but not really a sport. And Olympic sports events are left out as well. We're talking about professional sports leagues, the NHL, NBA, MLB, MLS, and NFL. The MLS would be number one on my list of sports leagues to integrate the genders. With the incredibly fluid state of women's professional soccer and an abundance of remarkable talent in, in players such as Abby Wambach, Alex Morgan, and Hope Solo, these women will be welcome and talented additions to any MLS side. Yes, they may suffer from a lack of brute strength. However, world-class athletes like these three would utilize their other talents, vision, quickness, footwork, and soccer smarts. Second on my list to, to integrate would be the NHL. I hope that the NHL will be the league to break the gender gap. First, I want to address the supposed the disparity between the men and women's games. I'm a little... <laughs> I'm a little silly girl and my stories are too long <laughs> nipples. One of the largest issues I have with men's and women's hockey division is the banning of body checking in the women's game. Women hockey players are phenomenal athletes. Let them hit. Anyone who watches the women's game can see that they are being held back. They want to hit. Once the elite women's players have been <laughs> cut loose from that shackle, people will begin to talk about just how talented they are and count down until we see an integrated NHL. 
Once allowed to begin hitting, women players will quickly gain an ability to play on par with the men. All across the ice, women will be able to play with the men, from centers to wingers to defense to goaltenders. The lack of a strong women's professional league also will provide more opportunities for integration. The surprise third on my list is the NFL. More than likely, it will be as a kicker or a punter. Many women soccer players will be remarkable kicking, kicking specialists for any NFL team. I think Debbie Wombat can outkick at least half the kickers in the league. Will we ever see a woman playing on a non, playing on non-special teams plays? Maybe. Is it likely? Not really. However, I will discount nothing and do hope to one day see it happen. I'm going to rank the NBA at fourth most likely to get to my, integrate my the genders. Story wasn't this long. Even though I love Deladon and respect Brittany Griner. Basketball requires strength, length, and size. The confined space of the basketball court does not allow for women players to utilize their intelligence to compensate for any perceived lack of athleticism, which doesn't exist in my opinion. The dominant force in women's basketball appears to be athletic bigs. These bigs are remarkable athletes, but <laughs> they simply cannot match up in the NBA. They are too short to match up at the four and quite often lack the speed to play the three. When a woman does crack an NBA roster, it will be as a point two guard, or a small forward. Speed, shooting, and athleticism will be the key skills that any woman wishing to crack the NBA must have. The MLB comes in at fifth and last, wrapping up this story. More so for the fact that softball <laughs> becomes prevalent at an early age, and the, difference, and the differences between the two sports are very prohibitive to any crossover of the sports. Every pro league will eventually integrate, in my opinion, but I doubt that it will be on a large scale. I also believe that it will happen within the next 20 years. Can't tell you right now, I am looking forward to each woman who cracks the gender barrier and wish them luck. Over to you, Kenny. What? Oh, all right, sorry. New York Knicks are division champions for the first time since 1994, a time when Mr. and Mrs. Lay kind of figure out if they can pass off the blonde the junior we know and love today. After the Knicks 120-94 defeated the Wizards, the Knicks clinched the Atlantic division in the top four seed in the This win marked the 13th straight. Knicks will be looking to win their 14th straight game tonight when they play the Chicago Bulls. Five games, including a 50-point game against the conference's best team, the Miami Heat. If the season ended today, the Knicks would have the number two seed in this year's playoffs and would take on the Boston Celtics. All signs lead that out. If he continues playing the way he has been, the Knicks should end up meeting the Miami Heat to decide who heads to the NBA Finals. Make sure to come back for the free-for-all where I know nothing about the topics and still do better than Sam. All right, everybody, we're back for the free-for-all. Today's topic, should the NL adopt the DH rule? And which playing style is better? All right, which playing style is better? We'll answer all those questions. Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll go first. Oh, you go yeah, first. Yeah, I'm going to go first. Okay, I think that they should incorporate the designated hitter rule. That's what DH stands for, if you don't know. I know this sport <laughs> well. It'll increase. <laughs> <laughs> It'll increase. 
the excitement of the game and allows players to stay in the league longer. They don't have to go out into the outfield and do all that boring mumbo jumbo stuff. They can just go up to the bat with their old steroidy arms and just pop out some homers. <laughs> in addition to that, it'll allow fans, and this is what sports are all about. It's about the fans. It'll allow the fans to see their favorite players for a longer amount of time. Uh, a player that normally would have to leave the league will be able to stay in and you know just keep cracking off them fly balls. <laughs> Well, that was quite folksy of you, Doug. I'm going to disagree with you, though. I think that uh, I, I don't, I've never liked the DH role, and, and that's all, I'm a Yankees fan, so I, you know, I, that's all I watch is, is American League games, um, except when they play in the, in, you know, the between the two. Um, interleague play. Interleague play. Yes. There um, you go. Are you quite finished now? Do you make a point now, Adam? Do you have a point to make? Can we return to the, the show? DL? <laughs> <laughs> Well, wow, Sam's got Down something low. else on his mind, <laughs> folks. The DH, um, I, I think what it does is it ruins uh, what I think is so special about baseball, which is that you have to be good at a lot of different things uh, at the same time. You've got to be good at fielding. You've got to be good at running. You've got to be good at hitting. That's what makes baseball so unique. The problem with the DH is that you can have somebody who can't run, who is, you know, 300 pounds. David Ortiz? Yeah, you can have a David Ortiz. You can have a Jason Giambi. You know, you can have one of those guys who literally all he has to do is hit home runs. And I think that that defeats what baseball should be and what baseball players should be, which is well-rounded people who are athletic at, at, at all these different aspects of sports. Amen. Um, and, and I think that, you know, pitchers, it's the same thing. I mean, I understand pitching is a very specific and a special, a special position to play. It's an art. But if you're still a baseball player, you should have to hit the ball, too. I'm going to side with Sam on this one. Shocking. The only time you'll ever see me agree with Sam. And I'm going to reach back and I'm going to bring out a quote from the best baseball movie of all time Aww. called Bull Durham. And I'm going to quote my boy Crash Davis. I believe there should be a constitutional amendment outlawing DH and AstroTurf. AstroTurf sucks. The DH also sucks. They're baseball players. They're not a hitter. If you want someone to just stand there and whack the crap out of a little ball, go to the batting cages and turn that into a sport. It's a sport. It requires athleticism all the time. You need to play offense and defense. Kenny? I'm, I'm, I want to go with Sam and Adam here. I agree. Oh, Baseball. I can't have any friends. <laughs> no. You're I mean, I still dick. like you, but you're wrong. <laughs> you might be. Give me minus 10 for that one. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Anyway. Um, no, I agree. Well, <laughs> folks, we got the men in the black cal helicopters <laughs> I, I coming think, here soon. I think baseball, so, uh, I think oh, well, there's that. <laughs> there's that. All I, right. I, I, well, well, screw it. Do you want to finish? <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Because you're making such a good point Let's earlier. do it live. <laughs> All right, good. Um, <laughs> can I beat negative 35? Do you have any doubts? Make sure to come back and see the show unravel by the hands of a ginger. We're also going to try to find Doug. Uh -huh. also.
and I know everybody's excited for this conclusion. Sam yes, has found his friend. I don't know where that popped out of. <laughs> Sam's clearly overcompensating for something. And shockingly, he doesn't need to do the most, co most compensating this week. That would be our good friend down there on the end who doesn't know how to dress, looks like a bum. With negative nine, well done, Kenny. Way to drop that bar lower and lower. That takes real talent to do that sucky. However, Sam, you're not far behind. Coming in with negative two. Yep. That's pretty. That's like that's a good that's a good score for him. For me? That's incredible. That might be the best score. Well, yeah. I mean, it's no negative 35. All right, Doug. Yeah. And I know you've been dying to know. Uh, well, I'm still living. You came in in second, my friend. With two points. He gave the winner. Which means I won with seven points. No, Doug we has broke seven. rule one. No, no, Doug has seven. <laughs> we Wait. broke. Wait, did I win? Wait, what's we the actual one? one How many points, points did I have? No, we winning. I had seven, seven points. I you. <laughs> yeah. So I guess Doug actually won. Yeah. Uh, that's me. So. Dad, look, Ma! Ma, look at me! Ass. I'm going Dad places! Ass. I'm on TV!